Morning, everyone, um, and welcome to In the Boardroom with, uh, with Laurie. Um, this is the 14th time, I think, Mike, that we've done the, um, In the Boardroom with, with Laurie. And just to introduce the people that are sitting at the table, myself, Brian Thomas, Mike Titley, who runs our business development out of Cape Town, and Rob Olliman, who's going to be the star of the show today. So um, we'll get into, into why he's the star of the show a little bit later, but uh, just a few housekeeping things before we, before we get going. Um, firstly, for those expecting their CPD points um, coming through from uh, the previous hedge fund webinar that we did, those should be on their way to you shortly. And as always, we'll try and uh, submit this for CPD points and hope that uh, you're able to get at least half a CPD point for, uh, um, for this, uh, this presentation today. Um, as always, we have a little bit of fun. And uh, for those who participated before, um, there's going to be a secret word or a, a magical word that uh, both Mike, Rob, and I put into our, our, our conversations today. And for the person who puts it into the Q&A, right, Mike? Uh, for Q&A first, um, that, yeah, that, uh, that's able to guess that word, um, they win a, a nice bottle of Laurie and blended uh, red, uh, red wine. So watch out for that word, pay attention, and uh, you might be the lucky winner of, uh, of a, a bottle of wine. We have thought that we have to actually take some of the guys out of the equation. So Craig Shalor, James Downey, and Mark Liddy, who are previous winners, are out of the equation because we know that they make the, they make the best effort to, uh, um, to listen to what, we, what we're saying. So anyone other than those three are eligible to win the, win the bottle of wine, which we'll have delivered to you. Come on, there should be like, if you win five in a row, it should be like a big mate. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So just a quick, uh, quick update on, on Lorium. So we're now sitting at 38 billion assets under management. And over the 13 years that we've been in operation, we recently celebrated our 13 year um, anniversary and the 13 year anniversary of our long short hedge fund. We've delivered, we think, pretty good returns. So top decile or quartile performance across all of the funds that, uh, that, we, that we run. And if you look at our assets under management split, you'll see that the way that our, our funds are split at the, at the moment. So mainly in the equity long only space, Hedge funds, which, were, which is where we started the business, roughly 8% of, uh, of AUM. Fixed income growing at 5%. And then today we're going to be talking about this newly launched global equity fund. And we hope over time that you'll actually start to see a little bit of a slither of that uh, global equity fund coming into our AUM, AUM split over, over time. Our client base is still very focused on the international component. So Roughly 45% of the assets that we run, we run on behalf of international clients that entrust us at Lorium to run money for them in South Africa and, uh, um, and Africa. Um, when we look at the team, the team has got bigger over time. I think a lot of you will know that Rob and uh, a few of our other team members joined us from Tantalum in late last, uh, last year. And with the, with the building out of the team, we've increased the capacity to run all of those funds that I showed on the previous, uh, the previous slide, and also to branch out into the global, into the global individual stocks picking, picking space, particularly with the experience of Rob that uh, has been doing this for a long time, and I'll make a more formal introduction of Rob shortly, but also broadening the responsibilities of the overall research team filtering into, uh, into Rob's process has enabled us to, uh, to launch this, uh, global, uh, this global fund. So now to just introduce Rob, he felt bleak, he felt a bit, uh, how do we say, say scam to introduce himself. So he asked me to, uh, to introduce him. I've known, I've known Rob since my stockbroking days back at uh, Deutsche Bank in, in the early 2000s. Um, I met Rob when he was head of research at, uh, um, at Coronation. He'd already come back from Dublin at the point that I met him. Um, and uh, you know, Rob started his career at Coronation Fund Managers in Dublin with a bunch of other people that I actually worked with at Coro. Gavin Jubey, I think, was there with you. Yeah. And who else? Richard Campbell, Richard Campbell, Andrew Campbell, Tony Gibson. So we came came from a, came from a, a, a came from Dublin back to um, back to uh, South Africa and was running research for Coronation when I met him. And then I followed Rob's progress through to uh, um, to Tantalum, which he which he was a founding member of, and now I'm privileged to work with Rob here at uh, um, at Lorium. So Rob is not a not a stranger to uh, to running international equities, I guess, is the point. You know, he started his career in Dublin, and we were talking a little bit earlier when, I, when we put up the slide, um, talking about the deep end. You felt very much there like you were thrown in the deep end, right? I mean, that was the deep end. That was, you know, I was a young 30, 31, 32-year-old analyst, 
and uh, arrived in Dublin. Coronation wanted to set up an international international business, and I joined after the first sort of nine months of of, of that existence. And that was staying in at the deep end. That was I managed a Coronation European Growth Fund, which you know had just been launched. And between Richard and myself, we managed a hedge fund and then a pan European equity fund, which I managed. And uh, so that was that really felt like thrown in the deep end. It went quite well. Um, but you know, over time, this is a completely different um, you know, opportunity, I think, you know, 20, 20 more years of experience and uh, a whole team at our disposal to try and grow this uh, this franchise. So what we've what we've done with Rob joining is Rob Rob was well and still is running a segregated mandate that has since 2015 I believe been invested in individual international equities so non South African equities and what we did is we've launched this uh, global active equity fund and you'll see at the bottom line here that uh, that we've already got 26 million dollars in this this fund the reason that we were able to in a very short space of time go you know from the 10th of August this year to where we the 21st 22nd of September um, today get to 26 million is we took the assets that were sitting as individual equities within a segregated fund that Rob has been running and has had those individual equities and we've stripped them out of that fund and housed them in in this fund so um, that uh, that multi-asset class fund invests directly in in this fund and the, the reason it's able to invest directly in this fund it's a sec section 65 approved fund so it means that any uh, any other um, any other um, unit trust is able to to invest uh, in invest in it and over time some of our other multi-asset class funds that we have plan to make uh, make investments in the, in this fund that is in in process at the um, at, at the moment um, it's a it's a Mauritian um, a Mauritian structured uh, fund. Um, the minimum lump sum is five thousand uh, five thousand dollars, and um, it's a it's a daily traded daily traded fund, and it's very concentrated. Rob, and you're going to go through the the construction of the fund, but it's a concentrated portfolio of twenty to twenty five shares, and we aim to be fully invested over time. Now I'm going to hand over to you, Rob, and let you take us through take us through the fund. First, before I let Rob uh, launch in, we're just going to do what we usually do in our webinars and just give a sense of the audience's participation. This question is around uh, your average retail investor offshore. Uh, what percentage of the assets of the assets does do they have offshore currently? We'll give you a, give you an answer to that a little bit later. So the drive of the mouse. Um, I need to click on the thing. I think that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, and before I launch into the sort of investment topics of the day, um, I thought it would be worthwhile just sharing my own perspective and experience on how uh, managing a global uh, research kind of process and uh, and a fund from the southern tip of Africa has has you know how, how it's changed um, how to become much more possible. I think I think. Um, it's important for everyone to realize that it's a, it's a consistent process. There's no secret recipe that you follow when you sit in London that's different from sitting in Cape Town or New York, from, city, from, from, from my experience and from, from many others that I've worked with. Uh, we do very much the same, follow the same process and have the same um, you know, economic reality that, that we're dealing with. I think there's certainly an imperative which has changed over time and, and the, the, from a macro perspective there's um the the degree of correlation between markets has intensified dramatically um over a long period of time so you know there's no doubt that um events are much more it used to be if one day the dow kind of sneezed the next day the JSC would call it, would catch its cold you know that, that was the old cliche in the markets the reality is that, that, that those things happen con completely coterminously capital flows are, are the same but importantly not just markets I think are correlated it's also industries and and trends um again to to use a phrase tech tech knows no borders technology knows no borders um the flow of information the flow of um Industry uh, trends and and um, activity is is global almost on on, on day one. So uh, it's it's actually an imperative for us as a team uh, to be completely abreast of all the global trends that are happening. Um, if I think to more enablers, these are micro factors that have made it much more um, possible and indeed. Um, 
yeah, I, th I think it's actually uh, have helped grow a global process uh, very easily from here. There's, there's three factors that I've listed here. First of all, IR, uh, what is that? That's investor relations. So again, um, 20 years ago, uh, sitting in Dublin, we used to get management teams coming through. Typically, if a CEO had an Irish cousin or an Irish wolf found that, you know, swing through Dublin for, for, for a visit. Um, but investor contact was really tricky and we used to have to get on a plane to London. Uh, in fact, that's the reason why we moved our office to London after a year there. Um, so investor Just relations- you weren't getting access. In access was really important yeah. and, and we were battling to get that access. Now, yeah. every of these listed companies has a number of different investor relations functions. Everything is online now. Um, but even pre this kind of COVID pandemic, that, that function has ramped up dramatically. IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards have coalesced reporting to a much more coherent and structured and comparable set of, of, of um, accounting uh, statements. Um, data, you know, data is all about the quality of the data that you're looking at and, and having that, um, you know, I think, uh, was a convergence of, of standards has helped dramatically over time. And then just the raw data availability. So, you know, South Africa used to be blessed with the old Ivor Jones Roy research and then INET. And uh, in my Alan Gray days as a quant analyst there, we used to have pride ourselves on the investment library that we had of data, of, 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 of company uh, information. But now you find data everywhere you look. The raw computing power is, is high and there's so many ways that we can use um, information to look for financial signatures through, through our, our uh, universe. So that data convergence is really key to, to enabling this. Um, there's obviously, you know, a number of things which I, I think, despite the research, just don't change. And that's all about decision making. And there's really two critical ingredients for successful decision making and investments. One is knowledge and the other one is perspective. Knowledge comes from interrogating the information. And there we are fundamentalists. We are fundamental bottom up uh, diggers of truth. Um, and, and, and that's the one layer. I think the, the second layer, which does really just come with, with, with time in the markets, and that is perspective and experience. And fortunately, there's no shortage of that um, in, in, in the team at, at, at Lorium. And yeah, I'm really, really enjoying uh, that, that part of our interactions. Um, when you look at the portfolio, um, you know, there's, there's a number of things that, that, that come to mind when I think about um, investing globally. The, the global opportunity set has so much more quality in it uh, than SA. And I'm not saying that to be disparaging about the South African uh, listed space. It's just the reality of, you know, having a, um, a, a regional stock exchange versus uh, businesses which have transcended borders. We've obviously had strong South African successful companies. You think back to SAB, our mining companies, um, tobacco, which really flew from a small local player and, and, and leapfrogged into, into the, the global um, BAT that it is today. We've had successes in South Africa, but if you look at globally, there are so many globally strong franchises uh, which we can hook into. And so, over time, my research process, our uh, funds on the, on the global side have trended towards um, finding more quality and a bit more of a growth and quality bias in, in the portfolio itself. And I'll, I'll, I'll show that because it's not just a, a, a statement and a perception, it's a reality in, in, in when you look at the, the signature of, of, of the fund itself. Um, and then finally, just an observation about managing a global fund versus managing uh, a South African fund. Um, in, in South Africa, it's all about the things that, that, that your, your, your performance, your relative performance is very much determined by the things that you miss out, um, that you cannot miss out. So it's areas of omission, I would say. Whereas when we're investing globally and we have such a, a, a broad canvas, um, it's, it's about the individual stocks that we pick and, and making sure that we don't make errors of commission. Um, we, we don't want to make errors in the stocks that we, that we put into the fund. And, and, and that's really the only thing that I'm interested in. I'm not interested in the benchmark. Um, I'm completely agnostic in constructing a portfolio. 
uh, with with the benchmark uh, as a starting point. That's that that that's not the way we do it. Um, it's it's looking for individual idiosyncratic strong ideas um, and trying to make sure that we we, we hit as many um, as many many coconuts as we can when we when we throw the skittle. Um, the fund itself, um, just just a couple of points to 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 run through the the actual fund process itself. It's a consistent research methodology, as as I've explained. What is different about um, about, key, I think, about a global process is having a good screening uh, tool. So using the, 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 the data, uh, the quantitative data that I've, I was referring to earlier on uh, to screen out uh, this universe of thousands uh, and make it um, coherent. So we're looking for, uh, again, sort of financial data points, um, which mean that whether we're looking at a company that manufactures widgets or a COVID vaccine or makes cars, that ultimately all of those um, those franchises are translated into economic reality, uh, industry returns, company returns, and 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 that is what I'm interested in through that quant analysis. Um, we have a short list of about 150 shares that we're following at any point in time, and I'll, I'll I'll show you just a very brief sort of screenshot of of how we use a ranking table. We use a ranking table at Lorium for our South African research. We use a global ranking table in exactly the same way. And on Africa research too. So and on Africa, yeah. so it's, it's 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 really that is the way that the researchers input their 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 thought process and 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 generate an expected return. Um, we do, of course, look at some top-down or thematic ideas, uh, and I will run through a couple of those just now. Um, but the idea is to have a concentrated portfolio, 20 to 25 idiosyncratic ideas invested in the fund um, in, one, in, 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 you know, in one coherent portfolio. Rob, we could actually, while you talk, I can actually, yeah. while you talk to this, uh, this slide, I actually had Bloomberg up and... Sorry, I was going to try and pull up Bloomberg live here um, to yeah. show your to show your 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 ranking table. While Mike, uh, I'll, I'll share the results thing. while these guys uh, get organised. So this is just uh, feedback that we got uh, from you on the the question, the first question. So most people um, indicating that offshore allocations sit between sort of eleven and twenty, but then also skewed to the upside of above twenty and above thirty in many a case. So a lot of money having gone offshore. Um, and to our, our next question thereafter will be how much of that has actually been invested versus sitting in cash or, or risk-free type assets still. So you can have a go at uh, answering those whilst uh, we continue with the presentation. So Rob, talk us quickly through. I mean, this is this is basically your dashboard live that you would look at on a daily basis. Exactly. Um, and I'll just scroll, scroll up and down. Um, this is the, the, the list of stocks that uh, that make up that sort of 150 that uh, that you would look at and, and screen the screen for opportunities. Exactly, and it, it, it's you know this list is derived using quantitative screens. So I've got a number of different um, screens that I run based on on on, on kind of financial uh, measures. But then also, you know, we followed over the years in in South Africa a, a number of industries very closely developed up here. Peer base, so you know the luxury goods, the mining industry, the beverage, the tobacco industries are often, uh, you know, they really were the starting point, the kernel of information that we got back into, into global research. Um, but we've expanded that universe, you know, a lot over the over the years through the combination of top-down screening and then interacting with with with, with companies. Uh, and so, yeah, as I said, it's about 150 names. Um, this is the the kind of list. We have on the right hand side is an expected return. I rank the expected return every day. It just gives me a great uh, true north barometer of, of where, where mechanistically opportunity might lie. Um, and so when we get these rapid moves in the market and I'm either buying or selling, like, you know, you know we, we, we're seeing the kind of volatility we're seeing in the market now, it gives you a very quick calibration uh, of, of where, where the, the best returns sit. Um, and we're adding or subtracting to this list on an ongoing basis. You know, there's always new information and new ideas that come in. And then there's perhaps some stale ideas that, 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 that we just jettison out. And the other tool that, you know, there's, there's so many fantastic uh, portfolio analysis tools that are around there. This is just one that, that I picked out that is quite a new one in the market that we've been um, using now for a while. It gives us a fantastic, uh, almost a style signature 
for the ideas in the fund and, and the way I've expressed them in the fund. And it, and it, it gives me as a fund manager um, deeper insight into um, both my universe of shares so, and, and, and then well as well as the shares that I've picked. So on the left-hand side, there's just a whole lot of um, factors um, for those of you technically inclined, you'll, you'll know what the sort of factor analysis would, would, would represent, uh, including fundamentals, momentum, size, um, you know, in, in, in any kind of, of correlations that you'd, you'd see within the portfolio. And it, it helps me on the right-hand side see whether the portfolio is quite skewed or concentrated to particular uh, factors or whether it is a reasonably, um, you know, almost a, a, a scatter plot. So I, I, I like to see the fact that the fund has a signature, so a fairly sort of tight distribution of, of um, these factors would give you an idea of, of um, that the fund is reasonably coherent in its, in, in its structure. And then this is just a stock like uh, Siemens is, is one of the names in our portfolio of 23. Uh, and it just overlays its, that, that white line, dotted line shows its um, factor correlations uh, overlaid with, with the, the multicolored lines, which is where the scatter plot of the fund uh, positions are. And, and yeah, so it, it gives me a very good idea if I'm seeing outliers, if there's a particular reason, it makes me think again, what are the unintended consequences from this stock pick or from another stock pick if I'm, if I'm, if I'm trialing how, how, how to express a view in, 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 a, in, a, um, in an alternative stock. Um, themes, you know, I, I did mention the fact we are, we are bottom-up fundamentalists, but, but there are always themes at play that drive our thinking and, our, and guide our, our research and, and, and perhaps put us in a, in a position where, we, where we, we, we're finding uh, unusual uh, ideas or idiosyncratic value. Um, I've, I've got two slides on, on the global themes that, that we've been exploring this year that I thought maybe you'd find interesting. Obviously, the big one, which has garnered a lot of news flows, is tech, re tech regulation space. It's not just China, because it's been coming, right, you'll know, in, in, the, in the US, you know, for a long time, for a long time, the breaking up, potential breaking up Zuckerberg in, the, in, in, in front of the Senate. Uh, so Facebook, Google, Amazon's power. So I think in the in the US space it's definitely topical, and we we certainly have exercised a fair few miles of of, of talk around that. Um, and then in China, what is real regulation, uh, and what is indeed in the price? Um, and that's also been a hot topic, and and we've done a lot of granular research about that. The reopening trade post COVID, you know, I'm not going to run through all of these in too much detail, but it's quite clear we're thinking a lot about uh, the channel shifts out of home to or on, on, on premise consumption to, to out of home, to in home consumption, looking at the different margins um, that that um, implies for, for the companies, both food and beverage and food service companies. Some of the leisure habits, do people still travel as much as they did? Looking for, for, for nuances there. And then the retail preferences, again, home shopping, et cetera. So uh, that, that's been quite key. And, and you know, we've invested in something like a Heineken, for instance, which is been hurt from, from some of the uh, COVID trends um, having a very strong European on-premise consumption mix. Um, but the reopening trade as that evolves, we'll, we, you know, we'll give that a nice tailwind. Uh, resources supply, um, gee, we can, we, we can have a whole webinar about the resources counters um, up and down. Um, but it's, it's been a huge theme, the CAPEX cycle uh, globally in, in resources space. You know, these businesses almost went bust five, six years ago, they've been very slow to, to, to spend again. The impact of environmental concerns uh, in ESG governments, governance in general, if you look at how Rio Tinto battled with their, um, in the Pilbara, you know, they, they, they destroyed some uh, Aboriginal um, heritage sites. And basically Rio has, has, has put on hold almost all of its, its, its greenfields capex, or and even, you know, its brownfields capex in that area. The east-west tensions, people wanting to get greater control of their supply chain. It's not just uh, US, China, it's, as an example, it's Australia and the US um, against China. And in some way that's exacerbating some of those tensions. So on the resources supply chain, it's been quite tight. Uh, and then on the auto space, you know, it's, it's, we're suddenly seeing an acceleration. Everyone was just, 
Tesla or bust when it came to battery electric vehicles. Moving from internal combustion engine to battery electric vehicles, it looked like Elon Musk was the, the lone ranger in that space. Uh, COVID has accelerated dramatically um, through you know, the, the push for, for um, green credentials and, and a reduced carbon footprint has pushed this dramatically through the mainstream automakers. And it's been a big, a, a big space uh, for us thematically over the last sort of 12, 18 months um, going forward. The interesting thing is of having a, a guy like Rob Ben House and looking at individual stocks is that we're able to kind of observe this butterfly effect. Now, the butterfly effect, I think everyone knows, is kind of the, the butterfly flapping its wings in, let's say, South Korea, how it impacts uh, what happens in South Africa. And this, you know, the objective of these boardroom sessions is to bring you a little bit closer to some of the discussions that we're having literally on a daily, daily basis in this, uh, in this boardroom. And one that's very ripe at the moment is what's going on in South Africa in the, in the platinum market. Now, this is quite a sort of circular, circular butterfly effect. We, we started looking at, uh, at platinum. Obviously, there are lots of big platinum companies listed in South Africa. The big demand for the platinum or PGM metals comes mainly out of the automobile industry. And the big demand for the automobile industry were people, frankly, after COVID, actually wanting to drive their own car rather than, uh, um, rather than uh, being in public transport. The huge demand for cars has pushed the platinum, rhodium, and rhodium prices significantly, obviously also with the, with the increased legislation around, uh, around emissions. So platinum got pushed because of car demand. The car demand was uh, was was high, and the cars have had increased loadings of uh, of chips in the car, microchips in the car. So I think Rob, the the number is about five hundred dollars a car now, right? Of, yeah. of chips in the, in an average car, but the the bigger ones like two and a half thousand dollars worth of chips or something like uh, that. To, yeah, it's more one and a half, one and a half, um, up to two in in, in obviously the. But and, yeah, and chips and semiconductors have become a much bigger part of, of the cost automobile. Yeah. And they've also been in huge demand with all of us working from home. I think everyone on this call will have had to buy something work from home related, whether it was a router or an extra screen or whatever, all using chips. So there's been this huge demand for chips and this massive chip shortage now in the world. And that has now resulted in actually the automobile manufacturers not being able to produce cars. There's a huge understocking of cars at the moment, which then has this, again, now negative knock-on impact into, into platinum, rhodium, et cetera. And we've seen rhodium, I think, is off just over 30% this month, um, mainly as a result of the chip shortage that is driving the car the car manufacturers not being able to produce, which is then resulting in a lower rhodium price. And then it actually impacts the South African economy even further. We had this huge windfall last year in South Africa of these, the, these great platinum, palladium, rhodium prices generating great, uh, great benefits for the fiscus. All of a sudden, that's disappeared. It's just gone overnight, not because of anything except the, the, chip, the, the chip manufacturer and the chip shortage, which is something that you're looking at and bringing to life in our, in our meetings on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. So it actually, I guess the point here is that it's not only the global fund that, uh, that, that interests us, it's actually feeding that global process into our own thinking in South Africa that, that's adding value to the rest of our funds. This, this butterfly effect, it, it's, it's not lost, the irony is not lost on me that, you know, I, I started looking at the automakers as a corollary research from the PGM metal demand. You know, we were looking at the PGM metal supply and demand um, in, in an intense way going through into the automakers, having to understand the shifts in, in this um, consumption pattern. What's changed now dramatically is that Mike is on at me every day about what's happening in the auto space. A different Mike. Mike Lawrence. Mike Lawrence. Not, Mike. <laughs> not Mike Tiffany. <laughs> and, and, and pulling that information almost on a live basis back into his platinum research. So it's effectively now the automakers sector has become, you know, almost like the, 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 driver, the, platinum. the driver of the platinum view. Uh, and and certainly our um, you know activity in in the, in the sector has been very aware of that uh, of, of that process. Um, yeah, so th th there's obviously other themes that have gone on. Um, the pattern of, of of stimulus globally has shifted from the central bankers and is still in the process of being handed over to 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 fiscal stimulus. Uh, what I mean by that is, is the, the kind of interest rates we're setting the policy and, and, and pushing a lot of liquidity into, into global markets through COVID. Um, but 
you know, that has largely run its course, right? So we're looking to see a normalization of monetary policy. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing um, governments recognizing the need to, to, to continue to step in, fill that gap through fiscal means. Uh, we're seeing a massive infrastructure rollout in the US under the Biden presidency. Uh, and obviously that has an impact on traditional cyclicals in that area. I mean, you would all know when we looked at, at South Africa, if there was a, a, a big infrastructure push ahead of um, the, the Soccer World Cup in 2010, how the construction companies, the cement companies were extreme beneficiaries of that infrastructure push. So again, it's, 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 it's obvious that looking at the global cement companies has been you know, one of the focus areas uh, for, for research over this time period. But then also more than that, translating uh, traditional cyclicals into, into new, uh, more um, green credential product projects. So you know, hydrogen, the, the, the hydrogen economy, it's this real buzzword, uh, but there's been a, a number of key lines of, of research which we pursued uh, in, in thinking about those hydrogen projects and, and, and who the beneficiaries are from that. Online retail, I think I've more or less covered. I thought yeah. the interesting one was just the logistics side, uh, Brian, was you know, we've been uh, quite, quite nice uh, investors. Who we benefited nicely from being exposed to a, a, a stock in the logistics space, which has done really well uh, through, through that, and I'll touch on that just now. And then another theme which doesn't get much airplay, I think, is just the effect on banks and financials. You know, banks and, and traditional insurers have been under the, so much pressure globally since the financial crisis. Um, their business models have been under attack, A, through the regulator attacking them and wanting them to delever and have hold more capital. Uh, but then also you've seen um, a whole lot of virtual e uh, fintech businesses uh, arise in exactly that space at the same time. So uh, they've been relatively, you know, uh, relatively thin investment opportunities, I think, over the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but with this potential steepening in the, in the, in the yield curve and with a strong capital buildup that we've seen, COVID provisions not being needed and now being released, um, it's providing actually quite a nice tailwind for the sector. And we see still some opportunities there. And that thematically has been uh, a, a nice area for us. I'm just going to share the results from our the second question, which we put through. I think a few people are getting butterflies in their stomach just hanging on to cash internationally when these kind of funds and opportunities are out there and cash is paying very little and, and fixed income in developed markets the same. So it's good to see that, you know, only 42 odd have less than 50% uh, uninvested and the rest have gone uh, quite, quite well invested from there. So this, this is just a schematic of, of, of holdings in the portfolio. I'm trying to kind of group the portfolio as we currently have it into, into four quadrants. I could have picked, as we saw in the, 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 the kind of signature of the fund, I could have picked uh, 20 different quadrants if, if, if I had uh, wanted to do that. Because the reality is we, we, we largely have idiosyncratic ideas. Um, but, you know, you, what I said earlier on about the fact that there are so many great uh, and I use the word advisedly, great global franchises out there um, in the global space, whereas I think we have a much more limited subset here, that it, it shouldn't surprise you uh, in interacting with me and with the fund that, that you, you should see some strong long-term growth businesses in the portfolio. Um, Alphabet, Google, there's so many different monetization vectors out there um, Heineken is one I touched on earlier on about the reopening trade, but we think, see that as uh, the global premium uh, beer brand and having um, an opportunity to premiumize and monetize its position in the market uh, with a new CEO, cost-cutting potential. Uh, and I'll go through you know, a couple of stocks in a bit more detail, because once you get me talking about all of these, well, I'm going to We never stop you. So we better, we, in the interest I'll, of time, we I'll, better get you on to... I'll, I'll once he starts on these things, we, you just can't stop him. So we, we've, we've got a couple of... Uh, stock specifics. Stock specifics just to, to run through. So that so ones that I guess yeah. are less known by people. Less known. I mean, I, I, I guess this name I picked because everyone looks at Deutsche Post and thinks it's the German post, post office. And, and that's how it started, for sure. So it, it, it has a core business. It has, when I say USO there, that's a universal service obligation. It has to send you the post and deliver it. It has a regulated stamp price. Uh, you can imagine with letter volumes falling off, it's a pretty crappy business. Um, but parcel volumes have picked, picked up a lot, and that's that. That's offset. That's within the postal segment. But the jewel in this business is DHL. 
which is the world's largest logistics business. Um, and relatively not known that it's within Deutsche Post, uh, although they're now trying to rebrand themselves, DPDHL is, is, is often seen. And this has been a, a really great investment for us um, over the last quite a few years. Uh, we still hold it. It has re-rated um, quite nicely as we've seen upgrades to earnings uh, through this post-COVID phase. Now, COVID has given a, a, effectively a 30% boost uh, to volumes um, through this you know, enforced move to online, online fulfillment. But likely um, to be more permanent even after COVID. I think that, 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 that is definitely the, the conclusion. Uh, and, and that is perhaps where the, the investment thesis still has legs to go. You know, I, I, there, there is no doubt we, we might see a bit of a tailing off in the reopening trade. But um, this is still a sustainable growth business, uh, which, is, which is really attractive uh, to us. Uh, this, again, not a name that perhaps many of you will, will be familiar with, Essilor Luxottica. Um, they're the world's biggest eyewear, eye care business, over 20% market share. If you add, they, they've got, they make the frames, the lenses, they've got labs for the eye care um, professionals, eye care practitioners, optometrists in our language. And then they also have a whole lot of retail boutiques, all those Ray-Ban uh, sunglass hat uh, boutiques that you see. 70% um, of this business is lenses and that's needs driven. There is strong underlying growth for, for the need for corrective, uh, corrective vision. It's growing at sort of 4% globally per annum. Um, and they really position themselves as dominant vertically integrated players, uh, merger of a French business and an Italian business, which initially didn't go well. Uh, the two cultures clashed somewhat. Um, I followed this business from my Dublin days. Uh, they, they listed and I met the, um, this, the, the, the French CEO of, of Essilor for the first time, actually, in, 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 in my Dublin days. Uh, and I've followed the company since, and it's been, it's been a stormer. Um, and, and it's still a, one of those names which has sort of operated under the radar, and yet people are starting to, to, to recognize its, its underlying quality. Um, and then the other name which I picked out, so those are two European shares. This one is a, a, a Latam Coke bottler. Again, many people ask me, oh, what is, what is Arca Continental? It's very simply, it's a Coke bottler in, in um, Mexico, Argentina, and then it's also been given the rights to, to uh, sort of southern Texas and, and southern United States in some areas. Uh, again, hot countries, great demographics, um, population, and these, you know, Coke bottles are no longer just Coke, the, the kind of black fizzy stuff. They are beverage, beverage suppliers. We've got a very strong water business. And they're also going into a whole lot of adjacent categories. Um, what's interesting about this business is that as the Coke bottler system is, is, is being driven together by Coca-Cola itself, is wanting its bottlers to coalesce into a number of strong regional players uh, Arca is one of the potential beneficiaries from that. It's, it's, it's attractively valued relative to the other Coke bottlers. The, the, the economic metrics of the Coke system are, are, are very easy to predict and to model um, and with strong underlying demand for, for the product. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a really strong underlying cash flow generator. So again, a business that has started to re-rate that we've recognized uh, over the last two years or so. And, and we now started to see the re-rating benefits from, from recognizing that early. So just to conclude, um, really from, from, from the fund perspective overall, you know, the bottom left, there, there is an all country world index benchmark, but it's not constructed like that. It's, um, it's really constructed with a, a clean sheet of paper in terms of, of portfolio construction. We do look at special situations and tactical trades. We've had one or two of those and, and we'll continue to, you know, we, we're small and nimble enough to be able to take advantage of, of that over time. Uh, completely unconstrained portfolio construction, um, no geographic limitations. So can go Asia, uh, Europe and, and the Americas as well as Africa. Uh, and we do have representation across the globe uh, in, in the fund currently. 20 to 25 shares, why 20 to 25? Look. There's a lot of research. Once you get past about 10 individual investment names that you start, um, that the, the benefit of diversification from, from, from adding more names starts kind of leveling out. Uh, so it's the kind of law of diminishing marginal returns from that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the correlations um, 
obviously initially you, you, you want to you know, diversification is a free lunch, right? So, yeah. so you, you want to diminish risk by having a diversified portfolio. We don't put all our eggs in one basket. Um, but once you get beyond about sort of 10 to 15 names, um, that, that diversification benefit tops out. But we want to have a, a, a limited number. As I said, we, we don't want to make too many errors of commission. We want to every shy coconut when we when we hit that um, uh, the, the portfolio itself. So, um, I think 20 to 25 names is more or less the sweet spot of rich ideas uh, and yet the benefit of diversification in it. It's it's a strategy which is not launched now. It's just that the fund is launched uh, now and it is yeah, section 65 approved. We've been going for, 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 for quite some time. And then Mike's got a special fee deal for you. <laughs> <laughs> we always like to entice people clients and customers to come into our funds to support us in these initial phases. So we are running the, the initial fee at basically half, half the price. The fund normally prices at 1%. You can get it at 50 bips, so almost passive kind of fees, until the 31st of March. So we encourage you to come in. The water's warm, as Rob always says. I think it's important uh, that, a lot of us that we, we all in. invested. So yeah. you know, I think... Uh, Virtually everyone who's got a little bit of capital overseas at Lorium is invested. Um, Rob and I have been invested from day one, and more and more um, Lorium people are, are invested. And we've had some interesting support from, uh, um, from I guess, uh, friends and family and uh, um, other, other market participants. So it's not, just, um, it's not just the funds money and Lorium money, and there's, uh, there's some third party that have come in too. So... Um, interesting to have that uh, support. Yeah, very gratified by the interest that we've had actually in the and 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 the support. So um, it definitely shows that there is an interest and a demand for for having a local fund manager that you can speak to, that you can you know you understand the the shares and um, and you know we're as accessible as we always have been. I think as a as a, as a team in engaging with with our investors around the the, the portfolio, the uh, construction of that, and the ideas within it. Right, so we've got one more question for the audience, which is around the 12-month return uh, on global equities, which I'm going to put up now just to see if any of you have, have some thoughts on that. And we've got a few questions that have come in. And we also have a winner of our um, latest bottle of 2018 Lorium wine. Um, and well done to Bryn Hattie, who came in first with that. And the, the word was butterfly, uh, if the rest of you uh, missed that one. So and I'll personally deliver your wine to you. <laughs> <laughs> so a few questions that have come in. Uh, availability at the moment, as it was only launched last month, we still are in the process of, of loading it onto Lisps. We are basically done with the Glacier platform. I think it's just the fee class which is being loaded for this reduced fee. Um, we are going to be going onto the Momentum um, platform as well. We're approaching them to get it onto there. And obviously appreciate your support uh, on that side. Um, and then questions to, to Rob. So one of the, the first ones um, from one of our regular attendees, Mark Liddy, uh, how is the Evergrande going to affect your funds and the markets in general? Is there going to be another knee-jerk reaction? Uh, I, the answer is yes, because I think it's currently happening, um, sadly. Yeah. Um, there's, there's some debate whether that's uh, um, you know, a, a Lehman type moment or an LTCM moment was a was a was a piece I was reading earlier on. Uh, Mark, the reality is it's it, it's it's very hard to say um, going forward. But the 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 property sector, the real estate sector, underpins a lot of Chinese uh, policy and, and growth. And our expectation is that um, that that Evergrande is uh, still important enough for for China to respond. Perhaps not directly through saving Evergrande in its entirety and bailing the thing out, um, but perhaps through, through other stimulus measures around and about the sector uh, to try and prevent contagion of, of that episode uh, in, into the broader economy. So it's, it's central, I think, to, to uh, Chinese policy. So we would expect this, I mean, it's going to be a rocky, uh, a, a rocky period. Um, we own some Chinese tech shares, so we own both Alibaba and Tencent through through process. More recently, we've, we've invested in both those names quite recently because we think that the the regulatory space is actually in the process of 
of uh, bottoming out. When I say bottoming out, as in the shares are bottoming out through through the regulatory process now, taking its almost peak regulation. Um, we haven't gone any deeper into into other regional um, infrastructure or, or oversold uh, real estate names in Hong Kong and, and, and in China, and we certainly don't intend to do that in the short term. But I think, um, and I think it's, it's, our, it's our team's view that, that, that Evergrande um, will, will still be contained by, by the Chinese uh, authorities. Thanks, Rob. Um, question from Bartu. We do, we do have a fact sheet, Bartu. Unfortunately, with the short track record at the moment, you can't do an official one. But we do have an information sheet, which we're happy to send out. That will be available on the website too. Um, and Rob's also written a few quarterly commentaries, yeah. even back before the fund was fund was launched, which we're happy to happy to share. Happy to send that out. Anyone who would like that, please get in contact. Uh, Mark Donaldson, Rob. The majority of active fund managers do not beat the MSCI Acqui or the FTSE World Index over a meaningful time period. What makes you confident that you can be the, one of the successful ones? Great question, because um, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of skeptic. The, 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 the global fund management space has been uh, a, a difficult one for a number of years now, mainly because it's an extremely narrow market. If you take just the top five shares in the S&P 500 or any measure of, um, of returns, there's been such a concentrated um, portfolio in the recent past, and, and that, and, and I'm, I'm emphasizing in the recent past, as in up to the last sort of five, eight, ten years, um, it's unusual because it is a little bit like the South African situation. It has been about errors of omission, contrary to what you know, sort of I think the longer term run run rate is. And if you didn't have any of those shares in size, you wouldn't have beaten any index. And, and most active managers over that time period would have battled with that. Our, our, our view, certainly my personal view, is that that um, a lot of that, that those trends uh, have have played their way out to um, perhaps close to maturity. Um, there are obviously still some big companies which are you know strong growth, high, good, you know, great franchises. So, so it's not as if we we um, abandoning ship on on the large five fangs as an example. But um, I, I, I think the spectrum of returns is going to broaden out, and I think it's a stock pickers market uh, going forward. So I think it's a great it, it, it's a great time and opportunity to to kind of prove our worth as stock pickers uh, looking looking forward. Great. Just one or two I can answer quickly. It's not an Irish use. It's uh, it's domiciled in in Mauritius. Uh, to answer Andrew Clayton's one question, and then from Tricia, the minimum investment requirement is five thousand dollars um, on that. I think that's all the time we have um, yeah. today. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so I think just say thoughts? thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for dialing in. We've had a number of people dial in, and thanks for the interest and uh, and dirty support. And we'll be back, I guess, next month with another another webinar. We'll figure out a new topic for a, a new month um, and bring you back into our boardroom for that. But thanks everyone for dialing in, and have a have a good day out there. Yeah, thanks everybody. There are a few unanswered questions. We'll come back to you privately. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks for your interest.